Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this science hour. We will, be, we will be talking about the RIP sensor for the respiration monitoring. Uh, the presentation will be conducted by myself, Catherine, and Pedro, and we will cover the following topics. Okay, so we'll start by the basics, talk about the functioning of the sensor, uh, the physiology behind the signals acquired, and then talk about the positioning of the sensor, then uh, talk about the differences between the different product lines at uh, Plux, um, and later we'll give some examples of good quality signals and bad quality signals, have a hands-on session, and finally uh, mention some applications that you can have with this sensor. Okay, so starting by the basics, I will start by explaining how the sensor works. Okay, so <clears throat> the RIP sensor is composed of an elastic band with an electric conductor inside. The sensing element is embedded in the chest strap fabric, as you can see in the figure, in white and spans its full length. The conductor is rolled around the body, which will be the core of the coil the coil formed by the electric sensing unit. So a current passing through the coil generates a magnetic field around. The magnetic field combined with the cross-sectional area, the area of the core, which in this case is the chest, and the angle between the magnetic field vector and the cross-section generates the resulting magnetic flux, which is the expression you see inside the blue box. Uh, the magnetic flux generated by the current I determines the coil conductance L. The coil, the coil is then connected to an oscillator circuit that stores energy based on its frequency of oscillation, which is determined by the conductance of the coil. The frequency of oscillation is converted to an electrical signal, forming the measured signal. So a, const, a constant cross-sectional area does not maintain the signal because the conductance is not altered and thus the energy stored in the oscillatory circuit is dissipated and the signal will go back to the baseline. In physiological terms, respiration is essential to provide oxygen, which is one of the key compounds required for the production of energy in the body and to dispose toxins, namely carbon dioxide. Respiration involves various parts of the respiratory system, but for our case the most important is the functioning of the diaphragm that influences the respiration rate, lung volume, and rib displacement. During inhalation, on the left side of the, the screen, the diaphragm contracts, increasing lung volume, which decreases the pressure inside the lungs, leading to the entrance of air. During this, the chest expands, meaning that the cross-sectional area of the coil increases, leading to the increase of the other measures, and thus also to the increase of the acquired signal. On the other hand, uh, when the diaphragm relaxes, which is the case of the right figure, the chest contracts, increasing the pressure in the lungs, leading to the exit of air. This time, the cross-sectional area reduces, leading to the decrease of the other measures and also of the measured signal. So let's have a look at the sensor placement. There is basically two possible placements for the sensor. The first one is the upper placement in the thoracic region um, on the nipple line, as you can see in the left image. And the second uh, possible placement is in the abdominal area between the 8th and the 10th rib, as you can see in the right image. Here we can see the plot of both signals for the two positions of thoracic and abdominal positioning. The upper plot is the positioning in the thoracic um, region. Uh, it is clearly um, shown that the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude is much lower than in the uh, lower plot of the positioning in the abdominal region. And this is because the displacement near the base of the ribcage is much larger than on the top. And therefore, the variations of the cross-sectional area is more evident. This is, for example, 
important in applications where we have a lot of noise and where noise is problematic because if um, the signal is more evident and has a higher peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, we can distinguish it much better from the noise. Then if we have a lower amplitude, then we might not be able to distinguish the signal from the noise. In this plot, uh, the difference in amplitude is even more evident. As we can see, the green signal is the positioning in the thoracic uh, region, and the blue signal is the uh, placement in the abdominal position. And we can see that the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude is much lower for the thoracic uh, position. So now we will continue and explain you a bit more details about the center. Okay, starting with the Vitalino product line, the sensor can be used either in the Vitalino Revolution plug kit or in the Raspi Riot wearable device. In the Vitalino plug kit, the, the sensor can be connected to any of its analog ports, uh, but you must be aware that the four of the ports are limited to a resolution of 10 bits, while the other two are limited to a resolution of 6 bits. In the case of the Raspi Riot, the sensor is connected to its analog port, which is limited to 12 bits resolution. In the case of the Riot, uh, the, the acquisition of the respiration signal can be made simultaneously with all the other acquisitions that the Riot normally uh, does. As for the Biosignals Plux product line, the sensor can be used in any of the analog ports of the 4-channel or 8-channel versions of the app, and also in the Biosignals Plux Solo in its analog port. Here we show some more technical uh, information about the sensor, which is inductive, has an output limited between 0 and 3 volts, where the baseline is around 1.5 volts, it measures the displacement and not the position, as we mentioned before, and allows the, the acquisition of raw signals and has a low consumption of around 1 milliampere. Okay, now Catherine will present some good quality signals and some bad quality signals. Uh, let's hear it. Okay, so let's have a look at um, good quality signal. As we can see in this plot, there's little to no baseline wandering, which means uh, there's no uh, shifts parallel to the x-axis. Uh, we can see clean and periodic peaks and valleys, an approximate sinusoidal form of the signal, and as the bandpass filter filters all frequencies above 1 hertz, we do not have any 50 hertz noise in the signal. Here is an example of um, a bad quality signal. In this case, we have motion artifact. Um, here we do jumping, as we can see in the plot in the blue border. Uh, the second peak um, has a vertical shift. Um, the valley is much um, earlier, and the peak is uh, the valley is much lower and the peak is much lower as well. And then uh, compared to the expected signal. And the second example is uh, motion, uh, the motion artifact caused by torso rotation. As we can see in this plot, also in the blue border, um, that we have significant changes in the signal where the peak and the valley are much earlier and much shorter than in the expected signal. In this slide, uh, we show you the limitations of the uh, sensor, and we want to point out that the positioning is very important. Um, as we already mentioned before, um, we do have a higher peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, 
if we uh, place the sender in the abdominal position compared to the thoracic position, which are the first two plots, where we can see a higher peak to peak amplitude in the blue signal compared to the green signal. The green is the first one and the blue one is the middle one. But this doesn't mean that the signal quality gets better if we place the sensor much lower, because uh, if we place the sensor, for example, in a much lower region in the abdominal position, as we can see in the lower plot, then the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude almost vanishes and we cannot distinguish any um, breathing pattern anymore. Another limitation is very slow breathing. So, so in this plot we can see that from second zero to five we have a slow inhalation and then from second five to fifteen we have this slow expiration. But from second seven, eight on uh, the signal switches and um, rises again, where one might think that uh, the person starts to inhale again, but the person is still exhaling, but the exhaling is um, very slow and um, there's no significant change of force detected by the sensor and therefore the signal goes back uh, to the baseline. Um, and therefore or we might think that the person is inhaling again. So um, Pedro will continue now with the hands-on session and show you the example I have already uh, mentioned to you before in real time. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to share the screen. I hope that you all can see my screen right now. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, what I would like to show you is a little bit the uh, how the sensor behaves um, in, in a real-time acquisition. So, one of the things that we have already uh, explained is the positioning. So, I've positioned here right under or basically on the lower part of the rib cage because this is where we get the best signal. I'm going to demonstrate it right now by doing some deep breathing. So, it also works with normal breathing, but I hope that deep breathing, uh, you will see the changes of my, of my uh, upper body uh, better during deep breathing. Uh, uh, so. So in this case, we see it very clearly, this is a very typical uh, respiration signal. We have a sinusoidal waveform. Form. If we take the peaks of the signal, we can then uh, extract information about the interval between peaks. And from this, then, we can also then extract the, um, the uh, uh, respiration rate, which might be very interesting to detect whether somebody is calm. Uh, for example, if you, if you are calm, you know, might have a, a lower respiration rate rather than when you are maybe on stress or, ner or nervous. Um, we will go in a little bit into more detail uh, for this uh, in the next slides. What I would like to show you now is also the um, thing or uh, the, the, um, the issue that we have with the sensor that um, is, is in terms of um, apnea. So if we hold our breath, the issue here is the sensor is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, we'll get into more detail later uh, about that. But um, just to give you um, example how the data look like. So I will do uh, two or three cycles of deep breathing and then hold my breath and then take on the respiration. So. So in this example, you see here that um, the respiration cycles are clearly visible in the signal. When we hold the breath, 
Um, the signal does a little bit behave uh, counterintuitive to what we might expect. So if uh, the, I, I hold my breath after expiration, it might be, for example, uh, thought that the signal will stay at the, at the valley and stay until I take on the respiration again. In this case, it is not like this. So the respiration returns or the signal returns to the baseline when I stop breathing. Um, and this is a very important thing that, is, uh, that must be known by the sensor because the sensor itself measures displacement. If we don't have displacement because we're not changing anything at all, then it returns to the baseline. And this is not only important for um, applications where we have just a respiration, uh, controlled respiration, where we induce um, holding the breath or we ind indicate to hold the breath, or we have normal respiration. Um, but also in the right example that I'm doing right now. So if you have a look at the signal, it flattens. It's basically because right now I'm talking and I cannot breathe at the same time. So either I breathe. Or I start talk, talking and then while I talk, for example, in this case, I'm not actively breathing uh, or doing some cyclic uh, breathing. Uh, breathing. Yeah, breathing mechanics in this case. So I'm not breathing, so that's why the signal starts flattening. And uh, because talking also involves some body movement in this case, you see some small motion artifacts here in the baseline um, that, for example, with signal processing could be filtered out. Um, but what's more interesting is um, well, an example that we have seen is the motion artifact. So especially the sensor that's used a lot in biomechanics applications. Um, here we, for example, might have the issue that uh, movement that's conducted during biomechanical applications can actually distort the signals. And this is, for example, um, by the rotation of the upper body. So if I do the deep breathing technique again, which now this segment of the signal will return to service a reference. This is how it should look like. But if I do deep breathing and I move my body, You see that there are some changes in the peaks and valleys and the section in between the peaks and valleys in the signal here. We can clean them with some, uh, uh, some uh, signal filtering techniques there. So there are some possibilities. We'll get a little bit maybe into detail about that. Um, but you see, for example, this is a challenge that uh, occurs in this uh, with this as well. And this is mostly because right now we're working with raw data and uh, we can unfortunately not just extract uh, only the movement basically that is caused by the respiration uh, itself, but with the sensor also capture the movement that is around it. Um, fortunately, the sensor is robust uh, against it, so even if we have these uh, motion artifacts in there, we can still clearly see what are the main parts of the respiration and still see the, uh, the uh, characteristic sinusoidal waveform in there. So uh, even with a little bit of motion artifacts, uh, this data is not lost. Uh, and this is something that is important to know here. And uh, this was my part of the live presentation. I hope you liked it. And I will pass on again to Katrin in this case. Yes, thank you. I will continue. Okay, so uh, we will continue now uh, with some applications. Okay, so the first application, which is one that Pedro showed in his live presentation, uh, is the detection of apnea events. As you know, LT resp respiration signals are repetitive in nature and indicate normal respiration rates. When the rhythm changes, uh, it can mean that there is some kind of um, condition underlying. So, low rhythm may indicate the presence of apnea events, for example, which are events where the person stops breathing, uh, which can be voluntarily in the case of that Pedro showed, but it can also be involuntarily. And then, high rhythm may indicate tiredness and shortness of breath, which may imply other diseases. However, these rhythm changes can only indicate that there is a different state of physical activity or a mental state. For example, if, uh, if an individual is running the, the marathon, he, 
the, that individual will have a different respiration um, pattern as if he was just sitting down the, the whole time. Uh, in the apnea, in the case of the apnea event, uh, the person is breathing normally and then stops breathing for a few seconds. As Pedro explained, it is a bit counterintuitive uh, that the, the signal goes back to the baseline instead of just staying in the same value. Um, okay, so that's because, as I explained earlier in the functioning of the sensor, the sensor measures the displacement, and so when the when the rib cage is not moving, the cross-sectional area of the core of the coil is not moving, and so all the measures stay the same. If all the measures stay the same, then the frequency of the ox oscillation circuit uh, will not change, and so the energy stored in that circuit will be dissipated, leading to the to the signal to go to the baseline. Uh, once the the chest starts moving again, all the measures will vary, and so the signal will also change. This is the case where the person is inhaling and then stops breathing. There's a transient, transient phase, which indicates that the energy is being dissipated, and then it st stays in the baseline while the person doesn't start breathing again. Once the person starts breathing again, everything goes back to normal. Okay, so the most notable characteristic of the resp respiratory signal is its repetitiveness. Thus, the most commonly drawn features that are taken from them are spectral domain features, such as the fundamental frequency, maximum and minimum frequencies over a time period, and so on. However, it is also common to analyze the signal in the amplitude domain and extract some features such as the peaks and valleys amplitude, the maximum and minimum, among others. Okay, here we'd like to mention four different applications, starting by inducing calmness. For example, deep breathing techniques are used mostly in yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and etc., and can be used to create a calmness baseline. So, using the respiration sensor, we can collect this data and then uh, use it further on on some kind of research. On the opposite side, it is also possible to induce stress. Probably the most setting or the most simple technique to, to induce stress is just to hold your breath. Basically, when there is no oxygen supply to the body, it enters a, a state of stress. And if we use the respiration signal to measure it, we can then again create a, a stress baseline that can further use in research. The third application is the most medical focused one and consists of monitoring patients with airway obstructions or other, uh, other airway-related diseases that can show distorted breathing patterns. And so if the doctors and the medical staff have access to this more objective data, uh, they won't rely so much on the subjective uh, reports of the, of the patients and so give better diagnostics. The last uh, application we have here is the diaphragmatic breathing, which is a technique used, for example, in yoga, which is used to strengthen the diaphragmatic muscle. So, in this case, for example, placing one sensor in the thoracic region and the other in the abdominal position, uh, the individual can have access to its own evolution, which in which they expect to have an increase in the amplitude of the abdominal area signal but not in the thoracic region. Uh, lastly, we'd like to mention the Open Signals add-on, which allows to extract all the already discussed features and also some more, for example, amplitude parameters, mean amplitude, standard deviation of amplitude, the energy of the signal, and also automatically calculates the histogram, some frequency parameters, power spectral density, and some time parameters, namely bit-to-bit -bit interval features. Yes, so our last section is uh, a question round and some more um, 
question was regarding documentations. We'll start with the question rounds. Are there any questions, ideas, thoughts? Uh, hello, I have a question. <laughs> uh, uh, th first of all, I would like to thank you and congratulate uh, all of you for this presentation. I liked very much. Um, and my question, uh, I think that uh, we have uh, some clues regarding the answer, but I, which I want to understand which is the major constraint to be taken into consideration while using the RIP sensor, essentially from the customer point of view. Yes, that is a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, so the sensor is very usable when we want to monitor normal breathing. But as we already mentioned in some slides before, uh, we do have limitations when we do very slow breathing. So, um, and as we already explained that in the slow breathing, we might not be able to detect the breathing patterns because the signal goes back to the baseline. And this application shows us that we don't measure the intensity of breathing, but we measure how fast it changes. I hope okay. that answers your question. Yes, completely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Are there any more questions? Catherine, yeah. Thank you for your presentation, uh, all of you. Very clear. Um, regarding the um, the artifacts that you mentioned caused by uh, movements, uh, namely the ones regarding jumping and other related to torso rotations. Are you able to process the signal with those artifacts or does this mean that uh, people need to remain as still as possible during the, the data acquisition? Thank you very much for the question. Maybe Pietro can answer this one. Um, so the question was, if I understood correctly, if there are signal processing techniques to remove uh, artifact, uh, signal artifact data. Exactly. Or if people need to still to remain still as much as possible in order to avoid the artifacts. Um, there are possibilities to uh, detect uh, or there are two possibilities to detect and to remove uh, signal artifacts. So uh, in filtering techniques, for example, we could have a look at uh, what kind of artifact we have. Um, if we, for example, have a small, a very fast changing um, signal amplitudes or um, intervals between uh, in, inter intervals between signal peaks and we can see for example okay if this is our fast changing um, artifact then we can extract for example information that there's that there is some high frequency information uh, information to the signal and we can focus specifically on removing this high uh, high frequency information from the signal um, by in this case, uh, case applying some low pass filters in this case um, and, for example, one of the questions that has been raised here in the chat um, was, for example, could we use also other types of sensors and combine them for detecting motion artifacts? Um, and uh, here specifically was the question if uh, this would be the accelerometer. And uh, yes, there are possibilities. So there's um, actually a field called uh, also sensor fusion, where, for example, you could um, combine multiple types of sensors to detect uh, motion artifacts. So, for example, um, uh, if you have some uh, motion artifact induced by jumping in this case, then you could, for example, use um, an, a motion sensor to detect when do you have an upwards motion, so in z-axis. Um, and when you have this, then to use this data to check the respiration data and see, okay, did, even if there was a jump, did it affect my data? If yes, how should I proceed? Uh, so this also um, basically gives you the information or helps. There are some, uh, some tools that you can use in this case uh, to improve the data that you, got, uh, you get. So uh, it's not always the case that you only have to look at the respiration data only. You can combine it from multiple sources that uh, are available there. Thank you very much. I, I okay, have Yes, Catherine, I would love also a question or, or uh, 
remark to, to discuss. So when, when Pedro was uh, doing the collection, I think uh, uh, when he was speaking, the signal was having some shaking, but there was uh, a bigger peaks and that might be that they were related to, to the breathing, even that uh, Pedro, you had to to breathe, to even to talk, okay? So I think if not, it will be a problem. And I think uh, with uh, processing, um, you may be able to extract uh, this breathing process even while speaking, given that when, when we speak, uh, our, our respiration is not uh, as uh, synchronous or, or so with the cycle so, so correct. But I think in your signal while you were speaking, I would say that uh, some of the periods uh, had a, a little bit uh, peak that was clearly distinct. I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, observed this, uh, this process, but I think it was breathing and so I think it's possible with uh, good algorithms, with smart people working with our sensors to extract this uh, breathing process. Yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that as well, Hugo. I've seen the, the little peak there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Pedro, were you breathing while you were speaking? <laughs> I was mainly focused on talking, so <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> no, but uh, that this is in fact right. So, um, the thing that happens, for example, also uh, during talking that might be interesting, but we also have to take in, uh, into uh, to account in this case, when we're talking, we don't have that controlled breathing. I think that is what I should make the clear. There's, of course, breathing involved, but we all don't have that naturally controlled breathing that causes a very, very clean um, a wave as we had it in deep breathing. Um, so, of course, I have to breathe during talking, also have to breaks, and um, that involves also the inflow and outflow of uh, breathing air. Um, but uh, yeah, so there are some, there are possibilities to do so. But uh, in this case, you don't. Uh, maybe you cannot expect to have it a very rhythmic and very uh, clean respiration signal. So thanks for pointing that out. That's uh, that's a very good uh, uh, point. Um, and yeah. Hi, I also have a question. Hello. Hello. Um, I want to know if is it safe yes, for someone? Please. Are you listening? Yes. Okay. Is it safe for someone that has a pacemaker to use the, this sensor? Maybe Rui can answer this question. Okay. Uh, it is not safe only because the, these sensors and our devices were not tested uh, to be used with pacemakers. So pacemakers are really sensitive implants that uh, sh people should have extra an extra care with them and so uh, without testing it it is not possible to say if it's safe or not so uh, people shouldn't uh, use these sensors if they use a pacemaker and yeah i think that's it for this you can also check out the user manual for the sensor and there we also clearly state that the device should not be used in patients with like um, any implantable devices such as pacemakers. So I think I might add uh, some comment on that. So basically when we're working in um, biomedical research or biomedical devices and everything that has to do with this, um, if you want to make sure that um, a device works perfectly with another device, you have to test it. So uh, it's kind of the approach is uh, if if you if you if you want to uh, to to propose that the use is safe, then you have to test it. Um, and in this case, for example, um, we have not tested biosignals plus devices with implanted medical devices such as pacemakers. Uh, and given that we don't have any tests there, we do not uh, we do not recommend the use. We we also state that the use is not uh, uh, is basically we must not use the device with it. Um, and uh, that's why we strictly um, put this aside and think that this uh, the application in this case. Uh, of biosignals plugs is not suitable for this uh, for combination with such implanted medical devices. Okay, we hope that this uh, we could answer all the questions. Uh, sorry, one one thing more. This, and, the, yeah. uh, uh, this this particular aspect of 
uh, seeing the the artifacts on rotation is something that customers came up with or we we knew by design because I, I was never aware of these rotation uh, waves that you get do you do you know apologies can you repeat the question please yeah no i, I was just wondering whether this problem of the rotation which i never experienced well i never paid attention to it whether it's a, a thing that customers noticed or we know by design that this, uh, this was creating a problem. Well, I think in this case, uh, it is something that uh, both we have noticed and also our user base. Um, one of the things that um, is important to measure here is we are what you are measuring here is basically displacement that is caused by breathing dynamics. So this is the focus. Um, that's why we have some places where we know, okay, this is where we can very clearly see this is a good place to detect specifically or primarily breathing dynamics. However, when you have some kind of uh, rotation or uh, motion artifact, then it is of course that the place where or the location where the sensor is, uh, is placed doesn't mean that uh, this location will not change, but the rest of the body changes. So of course, this if you rotate your upper body, also this the, the location where the sensor is placed will have some impact by all the muscles that uh, are involved in the movement, by uh, also the variation that you might have in, uh, in during your respiration and the, uh, the induced uh, motion. So in this case, it's something that you cannot entirely shut off one from the other. We could do this, but then this would also require some uh, processing of the signal uh, on a hardware level. And given that we are working on providing raw data, uh, this is uh, one of the challenges you face when you work with raw data. So uh, you cannot just extract one organ or one body part only. Um, the uh, entire physiological system that you are observing also has some influences and is interconnected with other parts. Um, and that's why it is known. Um, and uh, this is something of the challenge in, that you do then either in, this, in the signal processing or uh, yeah, in the applicational part of the sensor. Yes, okay, thanks. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> sort of, yeah. Thank you. All right, then I will continue with the documentation if there's no more questions. So there are some important documents and links we want to share with you. Um, the data sheet of the sensor, then there's a very interesting respiration report. Unfortunately, we don't have a user manual available yet, but we do have forum posts regarding basic function principles and the sensor positioning. We do have publications and biosignal notebooks, for example, for unit conversion. And we'd like to thank you all for your attention and we're looking forward to see or hear you all in the next science hour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank and you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>